Coming to you from Crash Studios in Music City, USA, Nashville. This is the Rich Redman Show. On this episode, legendary television and movie actor, Mark Shepard. And now, Rich Redman. What is up, rock and rollers? Yep, it's that time. Another exciting episode of the Rich Redman Show. We talk about all things music, motivation, and success. Jim McCarthy, how are you Yo, doing, buddy? Doing well. How are you doing? Hey, Jim McCarthy, VOs. Dot com. It's always good to have you here, buddy. I know we're going to be so excited about today's guest. I'm always excited about my guests, but man, I know we talk to comedians, authors, musicians, actors. Now, today's guest, Mark Shepard, you know him as the demon king of hell, Crowley on the popular show Supernatural, other shows like Battlestar Galactica, Leverage, Firefly, and in films like Unstoppable and Broken. And he's one hell of a drummer. Our new friend, Mark Shepard. How you doing, buddy? Good to see you, Rich. Hey, thanks for doing this. It's a pleasure. I'm a um, big, big fan. How are you doing today? What are you? Where are you, by the way? I'm in um, gloomy uh, <laughs> Music gloomy City, here. USA, Nashville. It's gloomy, man. It's like Sun, already dark something. outside. So Jim oh, is south. He's on South 65, leaving Nashville. He's in Spring Hill, Tennessee. You got a lot of bang for your buck out there. He's got a beautiful house. And where are you? Uh, in the La La Land. Studio City or, or? I'm actually in Studio City. I'm in the, <laughs> I right under the hill. I recognize that palm tree right there. Well, (laughs) very recognizable. So we were having this amazing talk about our favorite drums on the planet, DW Drums. And that's how it all started for you. You were born in foggy London and and got into drumming at 13, 14, 15 years old. Well, about 12. 12. You went pro at 15. Yeah, well, I was making records at 15. I I don't even know if I'm still a pro. I just sort of... You know, it's it, when you do something you love doing, you don't really know it's a job until you sort of end up not, being, not having to borrow money anymore to live. I mean, I guess that's, but not having to take a day job, that's like the greatest feeling in the entire world. Oh my God. Yeah. Yeah. So, and so that's where it started. You were telling me you've been on at least 30 records that people yeah. can hear and enjoy. And one of the artists that you played with a lot that you did a tour with in 2017, Robin Hitchcock. And I didn't know a lot about his music and I immediately looked him up. I was ashamed of myself. And I would almost say it's like, it's so funny, like Americana rock, but he's a British artist. So it's really just folk music. It's folk rock. What would you call it? It's actually, Robin has always described it as the, the sort of second psychedelic revival. If you think it comes more from, his influences, of course, were Sid Barrett and Captain Beefheart and, wow. and that era. He was never a Zappa fan. It's interesting. He's a, but his his music is so bizarrely popular and yet never has been mainstream. Because as soon as you start getting comfortable with his songs, in comes a fish or a frog or somebody's dead or there's a ghost. It's just brilliant. I mean, it just makes me laugh. His guitar player, Kimberly Rue, from the Soft Boys, which was an incredible band I saw live when I was a kid. And then that's why I asked Robin to join his band after he'd split up the Soft Boys. Um, Kimberly Rue had a band called Kimberly Rue and the Waves, and he wrote a song called Walking on Sunshine. <laughs> mm-hmm. um, it became Katrina and the Waves. Uh, Kimberly's, you know, I mean, that's, they're all, all those members of those bands and all that era of music in London was the guys that could. There was, when you had punk, it was an, an indie. It was all about not being able to play and just getting a record out, which was impossible. You know, I, I, saw, I remember selling 40,000 copies of the first record I did with the TV personalities on Rough Trade. That would be a success now. It was laughable. In, in 19, you know, 79, 1980, you know, you were totally never considered. And, you know, the, the dream was always coming to America and I never got to go with the bands that I was in. I never got to come to America and I came to America under, under different reasons. And then I ended up playing out here and I've always been, America's always been the soul of my music. I mean, want a real laugh? Robin Hitchcock lives around the corner from you. Oh, mm. right. He lives in Nashville? Yeah. I did not know that. Took me to that amazing restaurant last time. Was that Treehouse or something really cool? Oh yeah, I wonder if that's still in business. Like you know, we've had some closings with this yeah. situation recently. But yeah, I'm right on Music Row, and then I have a house out in the Burbs where I have a nice set of drums all mic'd up, and there's cameras. It's just like a fun playground. But this is convenient. When I got single after my second 
marriage. I wanted to live close to everything so I could just kind of crawl out at night and crawl in at night. It's the closest we get to like the village in New York City. No, I love it. It's, a, it's an amazing place. And it, it, it used to be in the old days where there was those that lived there and those that visited. Yeah. And now I think it's come together a lot more than it, than it ever was before. There's an openness to playing, which hasn't been around in a long time. It was like it was in the 50s. Yeah. It was, you know, great players found great players in Nashville. Great players found great players anywhere. And now there's a lot more openness because recording is no longer, as we were talking about, a $400,000 ideal. You know, if you want to go track, you only need a day. You need yeah. you only need a studio for a day. The rest of it, you can do it at home. Well, it's so funny. It's like the two musical cultures of Music City, Nashville, and then, you know, Los Angeles is always going to be an entertainment capital of the world. The way the two cities work we you were talking about a song i tracked called dirt road anthem yep. we we heard the demo we got into behind the kit on the floor eight guys playing at the same time we may have run it down made some uh, remarks about the tempo and the arrangement the next track the next track was the track and so yep. All the Aldean songs that you hear are number one songs that get played on the radio. We have never spent more than 90 minutes, you know, and I've been in Los Angeles where I've spent <laughs> half a day getting drum sounds. Getting a kick drum. I know. It's the old days. I remember that. I remember that time. I remember playing live. I mean, with Robin, the most extraordinary thing of going back, playing with an artist I haven't played with for 35 years was we went and did radio shows. So we did the, we did the amazing, um, uh, WPIX, we did it. We did, um, we were in Baltimore. We were in, did you do like Cajon or just like a small kit with brushes? No, I, I did, I did full kit, but, ah. was, but because I'm now a DW artist, I make a phone call to Scott and there's a kit provided. I am like, and it's, it it's so, yeah, but this is coming from a, a world class actor that has got his own trailer with yeah. food, Fiji water with the water, the cap twisted off. Can I be honest with you? It's gonna, it's gonna, all that means is I don't have to travel by van. It means I can stay at the Four Seasons if I want to. But yes, the truth of it is, the truth of it is, is um, you know, I was I was playing. I was, my first real kit was a Gretsch 2012 14 uh, Walnut. It was absolutely gorgeous. Kit, dreadful stands and hardware in those days. <laughs> seventy seven, I think seventy seven, seventy eight. DW was a game changer for hardware. I've never <laughs> broken anything. I went back to, I went to DW and I said, look, this is what I'm doing. They're like, well, welcome back to the world of drumming. This is, you know, you obviously, this is what you've been doing. There's a lot of, there's a lot of actors that play and with great respect to them. But I was actually a touring and working drummer my whole life up until, you know, I stopped and I did not pick up a pair of sticks for 20 years. So what, but, but what was that going on in your mind where you're like, cause I know you started, you started acting at 27. Does that mean where you were studying acting, getting into it or you started getting bookings at 27? I never studied. I did. Um, it's like I never studied drumming. It's well, well, it was in your blood because your your father. I, I'm sorry, you lost him maybe two years ago. Yeah, he was a, a famous actor, fifty years in the business, over a hundred films. So it's in your blood. Yeah. Yes and no. I mean, the funny thing was, is it was for me, it was that contentious thing of saying, well, you know, I, I won a bunch of awards for a play that I did in, in 92. And I'm, I was talking to the LA times and I said, was yeah, it the I, cock and bull story. Was it the cock and bull story? It was, yeah. it was a big deal back then, but and that's what launched what I went into. But, um, I said very clearly, I, I keep it in my bathroom on the walls as I'm, I'm not an actor. My dad's an actor. I'm a drummer. It's like the, the idea was, is that I didn't own it. It wasn't my thing. And I've discovered at 56 years old, I don't, I don't care about what it is I particularly do. It's the telling of stories. And that's what it is. And that comes down, we're talking about your drumming and why I love your drumming so much. Is there's a lot of country, there's a lot of great country drummers that, that are extraordinary. But what you do with Jason is something so unique is that you are playing drums to what he's singing. You're not necessarily playing drums to what he's playing. You're playing to the song and you always play to the song. Uh, and, and that is the, to me, the sign doesn't matter what music we're talking about, whether we're talking about great R and B, great soul, funk, everything that we've loved from every genre of music, you're either on it or you're in it. And country music to me now is not that much different than rock and roll, but there is one singular difference, the stories are vital. They're as American as they can be. And American by American, I mean, they're Irish and they're Scottish. <laughs> right. and oh, yeah. A little bit of English, but, yeah. but, but they are so about 
history and they are so about those feelings, whereas rock songs were about singular little moments or, you know, aspirational stuff. Whereas, whereas you know, sort of country music to me, great country music has always been realization of just how screwed up your day is or your life is or what you did. <laughs> well, well, really kind of like what's happening you know, I've heard it described a million times. Country music, the lyrically, is about everything that happens between New York and Los Angeles. Yeah. So, you know, they call it the song about the flyover, flyover, flyover states. states. I love the flyover yeah. states. First time I heard flyover states, every arm on my arm hair stood up. I had goosebumps. I was like, now that's a well written song. And yeah, it is. Well, it's the passion. And yet again, this is the trouble with a lot of politics today, without getting into politics. But I'm just saying there's something about I'm, I'm a proud American. I love this country very, very much. I'm Amen. proud to be part of this country. We just this had Peter, Peter Stormare on the character yeah. actor that puts uh, the wood chipper guy. And he was, he's so proud to be an American. And he's yeah, so I proud mean, to live in Los Angeles. I mean, we, get, we get to, you know, we get to swear an oath, not that dissimilar than the military oath. And, you know, we, it, it's a consideration. I don't just come here to, to get the stuff. I participate. I'm part of this. But I think there's a very interesting part that we miss is that a lot of America ignores a lot of the people in America. They dismiss a lot of the people in America, the simpler things. And country music has always spoken to the simpler things. Amen. Um, it's, you know, it, it's, it, great country is great country. I'm a huge fan of great country music, as we all are. And there's, uh, who did Turtles All the Way Down? Um, Turtles All the Way Down? Yeah, who did... Um, uh, Oh, an amazing country player. Uh, plays the telly. Uh, he was like the punk country player in the last few years. Oh, is it me like Keith Urban? No, 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 not Keith. I know, I know uh, Brian really well. He was his musical director. He toured with you. Sturgill, Sturgill Simpson, gotcha. Sturgill Simpson. So Sturgill, I remember, you know, some, some of my, my two Texas buddies on a plane and hearing Sturgill for the first time. Yeah. Going, this is 50s country with yeah. – this sort of incredible punk attitude and this incredible thing. And yet again, there's a weird thing about drummers, and this is fascinating for you with Jason, and, and I should tell Jason this just so he doesn't fire you. Um, <laughs> when you listen to great bands that you really connect to, it doesn't matter, it could be the Black Crows, it could be, you know, Jet, it could be like anywhere in the spectrum. ACDC is another great example. Sure. The first drummer, the original drummer, has the feel has the feel of the songs, lived the songs, did the songs, is playing and singing the damn song as he's, as he's going all the way through. And when you change that drummer, you change the entire style of the music. And it's it changed really, the DNA of the band. Absolutely. Yeah. And it's, it, it, we're, we're the great forgotten person at the back. But it, why I love your drumming is that where it's interesting to say is where you sit with his vocal. You, ne you never want to step on his vocal. You leave... Never. You give that just that air in there, so whatever he wants to hit, you're framing it. You're and you got to push it. You push him along a little bit too. Yeah, because a, a good drummer is is conducting and following at the same time. So Absolutely. it and that's a that's a tough thing to master, and it just takes time. That's why we put the time in, in the trenches. You know. Well, how, how do you well, feel about clicks? I mean, clicks are, are great for edits, but. Well, we I think I think ninety I would say ninety eight percent of all big touring bands, no matter what the genre, if you're playing larger venues for ten thousand and above, and there's video content and there's lighting, you're playing with a click. You know what I mean? Yeah. But it's the beauty and knowing how to do that live because my whole concept is I want to play with the fire and the energy of a 16 year old kid that got his first drum set, but with the knowledge and experience and expertise of somebody that's been in the trenches, I just turned 50 and being, but also be able to lock with loops when you need to lock with loops yeah. with tons of energy. But then if it's just a dummy click, it's just you and the band. So you could swim around it. You know what I mean? And, it, right, and but then now, you, now you're talking about the excellence of music, which is when you're tying in audio, audio visual issues and you're tying in stadium sized uh, lighting cues and all yeah. this stuff. It's nice to have it, but it's playing off it. It's not mm -hmm. it running you. Yeah. You know, and, I'm not like one and two and three. No, it's just, it's just, oh. it's just, it's just like Will Ferrell playing a cowbell. It's all it is. You're jamming with Will Ferrell. Yeah, more cowbell is always. <laughs> you know, um, give me a break. I've mentioned hundred thousand people without a click track, and I did pretty well. So sure, uh, yeah. You see, you but, seem to you, you you have the affinity to Dirt Road Anthem, and back on episode thirty two, we actually had the songwriter 
uh, and the artist who Colt Ford, who wrote the song. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Who oddly enough is he's kind of getting into acting. He's done some voice acting as well. Yeah. So it's kind of like an, an interesting little... The, the weird thing is, I don't find that strange at all. When my connection yeah. to music is story. Your connection yeah. to music is story. You're con- you know, and what's the difference with telling stories? I mean, there's some, there's some great musicians who have been really amazing actors. You know, yeah. Tom Waits is a great example of, of as strange as you can be. I mean, Rick Springfield became a great actor. I mean, Kevin Bacon plays a musical. I mean, he, there's a list a mile long of, of actors yeah. that play musical instruments or musicians that act. Well, I worked with Rick in uh, in Supernatural for a while. Yeah, and dude, it's just like uh, I love his drummer. I think his drummer's the cool, the guy who has the studio out in, out in uh, north of Van Nuys. It's just, but it's changed so much. The world has changed so much. What we do has changed so much. Obviously, we haven't been out on tour for a while, which is terrifying. I know it's been a yeah, interesting but, uh, nine months. Yeah, I, 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 I can feel the hurt. But um, and then think of the companies that, that whose whose gear we use as well. I mean, they're not selling, they're not selling what they were selling before. It's become a very 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 tough time for me. And there's no Nam show this year. It's going to be virtual, yeah. and we're going to see what the heck that's going to be like. I'd be curious to see actually what the numbers they've done, like musical companies and stuff. Because as people stay at home, maybe they took up a hobby, maybe they did something else, and just you know. Well, we, we, we're talking about we spend more money refreshing kits and going on a, a new tour and stuff. And, and, you know, I don't need, you know, another 70 heads from Remo because I'm not playing. It's like it's, yeah. right. it's the deal, but I want to support Remo. I mean, I'm, I'm, I'm yeah. proud to be um, uh, an artist for the, for the, the companies that, that endorse me, which is just amazing. I just find that it's mind blowing to me that, that, you know, I have DW, um, Silgen, Vic Firth, Remo, uh, Roland, Fender. I, don't know. I mean, it's just, it, it blows. When I was like, I remember having my first, I played K's. I always played K's when I was a kid. Mm-hmm. No, like, I played K's because Charlie Watts played K's. <laughs> 12, 12, 14 grad. Can't smack them too hard, though, because they will crack. Mm. I don't know. Well, you know what? Because we did, <laughs> we did, it. we did in 2015. We did 11 stadium shows with Kenny Chesney. God bless his drummer, Sean yeah. Paddock. At the end of the night, we had to come out, and it was I had to play two songs to back up Kenny and Al Dean as they're kind of waving goodbye. And poor Sean, I, I, he's playing K's in a stadium, and I get on there and play the way I'm playing, and I cracked four of his K's, <laughs> and and after a while, he was just like. No more, bro. So as I was doing the kick drum at the beginning of the song, my drum tech would come out and put my Sabians up there <laughs> so I wouldn't crack his stuff. Yeah, it was wow. so bad. I think what it is is Sabian has to make the cymbals much, much thicker for people like you. <laughs> <laughs> well, Peisty makes the Rude series, which is for the metal guys, you know, and I've cracked a couple of those. Yeah, you but could yeah. get me to play Peisty if you paid me. When I was, it's, remember, music was polarizing when I was a kid. You, you know, mods and rockers, punks and skins and all yeah. that stuff. Stuff. I mean, symbols were polarizing. If yeah. you were, you know, if if you're a Deep Purple fan, it was pasty. If you're a Bonham, it was pasty. But but my hero was always Charlie Watts. It was it was just there was something about that man that nobody else could copy and nobody else could could take. And obviously, you know, my taste evolved. It was never about you know massive arms and, and lots of hitting. But yeah, so I remember I went to the Zildjian factory not so long ago. Um, I was there on a on a everybody's day off, so I was actually getting to see stuff you're probably not supposed to see that much. Everything but the foundry. They let me see anything but the foundry. You can't see the secret port. That's not nope. mm-hmm. nope. But I was like, "Come on, you've got one, haven't you?" And he's like, "What?" And Jeff goes, "What? What have I got?" And I said, "You must have made Charlie Watts a bellless ride, a flat ride, just to get him to stop playing that U fit that he's had since 1962 because <laughs> he has this." Mm-hmm. You fit ride symbol with no bell. Really? And he's he's like Columbo with his raincoat. He won't change anything. It's always going to be the same way. Don't like it. I said, I want one of the prototypes of that ride because I know you've matched it for tone. I know you've matched it. I know you've built it. And I've got to have one. And I, yeah. wow, we can neither confirm nor deny that we. Yeah. <laughs> I love that. As I was like, Ringo. Yeah. Ringo used to play with the same snare drum, right? As uh, Greg Bissonette we had on, uh, and you'll yeah. appreciate this, Mark, because he talked about how uh, a famous th- saying that Greg had, had said is that, and this goes back to the DNA of a drummer being in the band, right? You take 
any Beatles song and isolate the uh, drums, you'll be able to tell what song it is. That's amazing. And I'm going, yeah, I mean, wow. The, Ringo, Ringo is an anomaly. He was never, a, yeah. it, because, because I'm kind of from there, my musical yeah. tastes are actually what is now. Well, 1964, so you were born the year the Beatles hit America. Yeah, and, they, and, and they've never really done anything for me. I'm a huge John mm-hmm. Lennon fan. And music, I mean, Ringo's amazing, but, it, but it, it, what's amazing about him is his swing and his timekeeping. It's, he's ridiculously good. Uh, but he's this wonderfully awkward left-handed drummer playing fills that nobody else can play because he starts all his fills with left, left hand. So everything's mm-hmm. missing, missing one beat as he makes his hit, which gives him this individual style. But what he was, he was the, the local drummer who actually could play in time because he's playing in all these wedding bands and show bands and all this stuff. He's playing with these country bands and stuff in, in Liverpool. But I never, I never got excited by that. The music I got excited about, um, I, I don't know if I can say this on the podcast. It'd be very polite how I put this. Um, I once had a conversation with um, McCartney's bodyguard. I know a few of McCartney's players. One of Abe plays and everybody else plays them. Wonderful Brian Ray, all those guys are just extraordinary players. And he was like, you're not, you're not a big fan of McCartney. I said, no, he's, he's incredible. He's an incredible musician, he's an incredible contribution to, to world music. It just doesn't get me going. And he said, why? I said, well, uh, the most polite way I can do it, say it is like, so what, you, you, you can't make love to it. <laughs> you, you appre- let, me, let me put it, does it make sense to say I appreciate it, but I kind of don't get it? Yeah, no, 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 no. I appreciate it. Right. I mean, my God. Because I get it. I, I understand what you're saying. Cause I but I'm saying, but at a time when I was young and music was yeah. polarizing and you had to love something to want to do it. So it's so <laughs> difficult to get to do anything, to right, make right. a record, to play, to tour, to do anything. So you had to have your heroes. And right. I discovered that my heroes were, were the guys that played on every great Motown record and the guys that played... Um, Benny Benjamin, Pistol Allen, Uriel Jones. You're talking about people that nobody knew who they were, and yet everybody knew everything they'd ever played. Yep, they, but yeah, they were 10 feet from stardom. Whoever was singing Lonnie the song, Wilson. they were 10 feet away. Yeah, 20 feet from stardom. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. But I always yeah. tell everybody, you know, I'm 10, I'm 10 feet from every, all, every celebrity on my bio. Well, you're, 15, you know? you're 15 feet from Jason. So that's <laughs> But, um, but no, but, but genuine, genuinely, it's it's yeah. it's vital to say it doesn't matter what your heroes are. Yeah, it it's that you have to have heroes because you got to have some drive for excellence. You got to have some dream that you can actually maybe one day sound like it, and as opposed to to learning to read music and, and do those things, which would have been a great journey for me. But I'm a working class boy from London, and that just wasn't my path. It wasn't possible. What it was was listening to hundreds and hundreds of records and the stuff I wanted to kill over or fight over or make love over um, was the stuff that made me want to play. Yeah. Made me want to play more than, than, than anything else on the planet. I'm a, I'm a massive fan of, of that. And what's interesting, and again, country music, country music had that and then lost a lot of it in that pop country era. And yet there are some artists, Jason included, Isbell, a few other people that are just, you know, even Keith Urban too. I mean, my yeah, yeah. buddy Brian, Brian Nutter was with, with him a long time. Yep. And, and, you know, you listen to, there are people that just will not let it go. The passion that's in it, not the money to be made, not the churning it out, which we've always had in pop music. We've always had in rock music. We have it in rap music. We have it in every genre we can think of. But there's those artists that are individually artists and they're the ones that excite me. And the players- It's that, in their soul. Yeah, and the players that play with them, I don't care what the music is. I don't care if it's ABBA. I don't care if it's, you know, what. it's just that you can feel it. You can feel it in your gut if it's done with passion. Yeah. The hardest thing for a drummer to, I think, and that's the biggest thing about drummers nowadays, the reason why I'm so unimpressed by loads of chops is that it's not having the groove. Did you did you see the Zildjian Live stuff? I know you're not a Zildjian artist, but did you see the Zildjian Live? Is it like uh, recent stuff, like a, like a new yeah. video or something? Well, they we did, it, it, they got bored to death with putting drummers' drum solos out. They think yeah. it, was like, it was the most boring thing in the world is watching, you know, great drummers doing drum solos. It's like so they got Snarky Puppy, or Ghost Note with Mono Neon and everybody else that plays. And they did it in the round. They did like, the year before they did it in East West Studios where, you know, Summer Wind was recorded. Yeah. We all the hands on and we're watching six or eight of the greatest drummers that you'll see playing music 
music, not solos. Yeah. And this last one they did, Ash Sohn, who's one of my favorite drummers who plays on so much stuff out of England. Yeah. Um, he was in there and he was doing, he was up the Gogo Bull, I was playing, he was extraordinary, Dennis Chambers, of course. There was so, yeah. just so many amazing artists. But there was Ash, and I'd never met Ash, and yet I know him, and I know everybody who's ever worked with him, and, and we're sort of mates on Instagram. And I said, and he was terrified. He's like, I, I'm not that chops guy. I'm not that guy. I'm like, you got feel for days, dude. Yeah. He's the greatest, you know, 12 8 halftime player in the world. He's and, he's, most- and he's doing it for the right reasons because um, wow. two percussive art societies ago, he did his clinic and he did some talking and he got going on how he got into the drums and how it's affected his life up to this point. And the guy got weepy and he just bared his soul in front of the big room. It's ballroom 500 when you go in. So it's packed and he's at the headline clinic for the day. And, and, and he was man enough to shed a tear in front of all those people. He's a monster, dude. He's a monster. So you've got to watch this performance because there's a, he brought a singer in, which was fascinating because everything else was just not singing. And he's playing this 190 BPM, 12, eight halftime. Shuffle, right? A purdy shuffle. 190 BPMs. So he's got to his arm. Yeah. But he's such a beautiful player. I'm watching his I'm watching these the muscles on his forearm just expanding as the track goes further. <laughs> oh, wow. it's, it's arms. So fast, but it's yeah. so funky. And he did a take, and then they asked him if he wanted to do another one. He did another take and he came to this stop. And in the stop, there was a fill that he'd done the previous take. And in this one, you just see him stop and just lift his stick in the air. Bam. It was a fill with no fill. Mm-hmm. And the whole place just stood up for a drummer. Nice. The whole place just stood up. So it reminds me that if you put your heart and soul into the music that you're playing, if you put your heart and soul in and you care about the, the totality of the song and the totality of the feel and you're reading your audience if it's live and you're feeling what they're feeling. They breathe, you breathe, it moves, it does all this stuff. It is it is the most extraordinary experience you will ever experience performing. Yeah. That, being in that sort of realm of the, of the gods in that way. You know what I'm saying? It's, it's, sure. it's churning out the same thing. Great, wonderful. Showing how clever you are. Great, wonderful. But playing that thing just ah oh, it's it, it's and i you know i didn't do it for 20 years and i and i came back to it and i was embraced with open arms by yeah. by wonderful people who could see my enthusiasm and my passion for it i love it and it was just like this is gravy dude i'm 56 years old i'm yeah. playing where i want to play i don't have to do it for a living but I love it with all of my heart. The Rich Redmond Show will be right back. Those who are self-employed, especially musicians, think homeownership is unattainable. For Bruce Klein, it took seven years to purchase his first home as a self-employed working musician. But once he did, man, was it satisfying. So he decided he wanted to help other musicians and creatives gain that same satisfaction. Bruce earned his lending license and is now helping people avoid the mistakes he made on his seven-year journey. If you're a self-employed musician, he can help. Go to musiciansmortgage.com Powered by Movement Mortgage. Bruce Klein, NMLS, number 1465948. Movement Mortgage supports equal housing opportunity. NMLS, number 39179. NMLS, consumeraccess.org. Henry Ford once said that if you need a machine and don't buy it, then you will ultimately find that you have paid for it and don't have it. Nothing could be truer about energy-efficient LED lighting in your business. At Big Dot Lighting, we can show you how a portion of your savings from a commercial LED lighting upgrade will be paid for in hardly any time at all. Until then, you're paying for them anyway. Book a no-cost lighting energy assessment with Big Dot Lighting. At least 30% of your utility bill is waiting to be saved. Go to BigDotLighting.com. Are you a drummer looking to expand your drumming vocabulary or take your career to the next level? You can connect with me for one-on-one virtual lessons and consultations that are now 30% off. I cover topics like styles, reading music, the Nashville number system, charting, music business 101, and career guidance. Simply send me an email at booking at richredmond.com to schedule. And for more information on all of my products and services, visit richredmond.com. This is the Rich Redman Show. 
Well, it seemed like it seemed, you took a break, but in the early days, you're, you know, you're drumming in your music. It seemed like it was all moving forward. I don't know if it was that, if it was a struggle, was it, was the getting into acting, was that a struggle or was like you, you had that accolade from in 1992 and then I'm assuming you got a job and an agent and it snowballs. I actually had, a, I was doing this play and they'd asked me to do it because they'd asked everybody else and they couldn't find anyone. So I said, why not try Mark? And I, I hadn't done the acting since I was like 17. I didn't like doing it because I got turned down for a a big film and that was it i wasn't going to do it anymore when made a record with barracudas <laughs> i was like i went i went to rockfield in wales and, and yeah, yeah. residential album in uh, rockfield i was like no no no, no, no. I'm, a, I'm a musician i'm not an actor and then i got asked to do this play and i did this play and it changed my entire life but people would come to the play and go great it was sold out every night it was a big deal and it was like do you have an agent i'm like no do i need one and i'm like oh for god's sake hmm. It's like, do you have a SAG card? I'm like, no, do I need one? It's like, oh, you know, the casting director was like, okay, I'm going to put you on a TV show. We'll see how you do. And what was that TV show? It was Silk Stalkings, where everybody everybody gets their SAG card. And the the wonderful casting director was called Barbara Clayman. And she was like, "You you need a SAG card, honey. You need to be working. And then from there... I did a X Files, right? No, I, did a I did. I did in the name of the father first. So I did an Academy Award, seven Academy Award nominated picture. It's my go. first picture, and I thought all films are made like that. And you're like 28 years old or something like that time, right? But, but I, I only, I only just got sober at 25, so I was really still 17. <clears throat> I sort of drank myself into a corner, and, and and I was just trying not to do drugs. If you can understand. Are that. you still like? hands-on with your sobriety like are you the kind of guy that has to go to a meeting once a week or i i I need to check in i'm 31 years sober on january the second so yeah i just make somebody made contact with me on the internet the other day and i'll be having a meeting by zoom on monday it's uh, look it's it's not necessarily for everybody I'm, i'm i'm not an advocate but if you're doing something and you don't like doing it, stop doing it. If you can't stop doing it, get some help. I tend yeah. to like help from people who maybe been through the same thing as me. Tends to, for me, it happened to be AA and it happened to be, you know, that happened to be my path and I've never been let down. Even though It, it just seems like 12-step programs are brilliant. They work. Well, anything that comes from a place of love and inclusion Nair, you know, think yeah. about the stuff that you teach, right? Think about the stuff you teach and the motivational stuff that you do. Yeah. You're, if, if you're coming from a place of disparagement or you're coming from a place of, of, uh, of fear, there's nothing for you. When you're coming from a place of love and, and, and passion and want and desire, it's infectious. You can do anything, you know? Yeah. You can learn your chops. You can sit there and you do your chops or you can learn your chops because you're mad at it and you want to be better. You know, there's, there's a different angle to everything. I'm sitting there, I'm going, oh my God, I've never played a six-stroke six stroke role in my life. And I'm sitting there and I'm watching a guy do a film, a six-stroke, I'm going, I need to know how to do that because that's annoying me. But you have, right? When you did, I know you want to, right? Yeah, I mean, it's, Dude, I love it's it. in my blood, but I didn't know it was a six-stroke role. Oh, you didn't know what it was, you just did it. I'm going, Ah, okay. So that gives me a left and a right. I could go there and then I could go there. Okay. That's kind of fun. Yeah. And then it just sort of sticks in my head. You know, it's just sort of like, Oh, what can I use that for? And then what it's interesting. What if I'm playing that in, in fours, but I'm playing that in triplets. It could be quite nice. Yeah. Well, Monty Wilson pretty- have a good story about that. The six stroke role that he, uh, intro to song. What song was that? Oh, uh, an episode. Well, yeah, because uh, Lonnie Wilson, great drummer. I thought yeah. I was cool with my number ones. He's played on a hundred and twenty something number one songs mm-hmm. because he just didn't go out on the road for like twenty years. He just did sessions on the road, like and it was like life. prime time yep. for for Nashville. And so, yeah, he, there was this fill that he does it on this Martina McBride song. Right, so does got so it's a six stroke roll, a paradiddle broken up between two surfaces, and then a little hand foot combination, and a cymbal on B four. I stole it directly from him and have used it and repurposed it because good composers borrow, great composers, great composers steal. Same with acting. Same with acting. We steal from the My favorite in that is when you watch the uh, the Funk Brothers documentary. Yeah. The fact the only way they can tell who played drums on what because they played on so much stuff they can't remember it all, is it's boom, but that doom, or boom, do that doom. It's yeah. one or the other based on whether there was a grace note in it. 
Right. And they still don't know who played guitar on all the parts on Papa Was a Rolling Stone. They're not 100% sure. Because I'm beginning to think that, sorry. That, that a lot of great actors are drummers. Has well, to be. Whereas dumb as drummers, that's usually. Well, no, I mean, there, there's something about the talent, about the skill, about the dexterity. I mean, Jeremy Piven's a drummer, too, I believe. He's yeah, a, Joseph Gordon Levitt ju jumped in yeah. and sat in with the late night band one night and thought there's like millions of views of this thing. Stamos yeah. plays with the Beach Boys. Um, yeah. Dana Carvey. It's, it's, a, it's a weird thing. It's, uh, it's that instrument you couldn't necessarily do well with when you were a kid. <laughs> And it annoyed the crap out of everybody. And you couldn't be forced to play the drums. I mean, you'd be forced to have piano lessons. You'd be forced to have guitar. But nobody's ever going to force you to have drum lessons. I don't know. want you out of the house as fast as possible. <laughs> I mean, See, now, drum, drums was my first identity, my first yeah, big identity. And my brother was the piano player. And he was, he was great. And uh, he always had the accolades. And the family wanted to watch him. But I was always in the basement. Oh. But, I mean, that was my identity. I, that's I, the drums. That's I always cool. knew mine, I wanted to mine play. Mine was having like a, an older brother archetype type. It yeah. wasn't actually my brother who was playing in bands, and and I wanted to be like him. And I I bought his Ajax kit off him with a Beverly snare. Yeah, Beverly. But I think my my brother and I I, I I I would be I would we wouldn't be surprised if someday we are in a band together <laughs> doing something. Sure, know. I could see that. Yeah, that would be fun. I mean. Yeah. Look, we we love it. I mean, we're lucky enough to 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 have done or do it for a living. I mean, it's it's yeah. it's an incredible thing. And when we get back to touring, we get back to playing. It's it's an amazing thing. But what is it? I mean, you having gone, you went to North Texas. I said my 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 buddy um, Blair, Steve, Stephen Norton, well, his his buddy, oh, Stephen Norton, right? yeah, yeah. So Stephen Norton played with, with Loud and Sway, and he was pivotal in me actually getting back to playing drums. He was the one that said, you know. Why don't you just get up and play the song? And I was like, I don't play. So he was in a house band at a convention, and he said, come on up and play. Well, the lead singer of Loud and Swain played God on Supernatural. Oh, okay. And the trouble was, is with all my love to the to the creation convention guys, is they were using it as like a, a, a wedding band. It was awful. There was like vocal PAs. There was no mics. Any, it was just like, you know, they had the vocal mics for people for the convention. And... I had to come, I slowly but surely had to convince them that this was actually worth making bigger. And it became this giant, giant thing with a 53 foot truck that traveled to every show. And of course, with the, the wonderful connections I have with Fender and Roland and, and even Anvil cases, things that you wouldn't think of as being, you know, yeah. vital. We, we took this thing. I said, I'll, I'll do it and I'll, I'll be involved in it, but I want it to be like the last waltz. It's all I ever wanted it to be. It was like, which is really making it like Levon's. Uh, Saturday Night Special, which is the yeah. Act. So we had this Saturday Night Special, and you could find a song that an actor could do, and you could ease them into it. And if you play well enough, you can carry them through a song. So it became this thing of picking really good covers or obscure stuff, playing a lot of loud and swaying stuff. And it was just, it was a fantastic experience. And then what ended up was Norton and I ended up with two DW sets, our own sets, touring together and of course you end up having to play whipping post and all the fun things that happen with two drum kits <laughs> oh yeah of course and now that ultimately ended, ended with kansas um actually playing at uh, comic-con because we used carry on my way with sun as a theme music um so it, it just connected it's made everything better but without those guys i wouldn't be playing and yeah. the, i can play with robin hitchcock and oh god bless suddenly, me man. suddenly i'm in you know modern drama and i'm like i've never <laughs> been modern drummer in my life and everything happens for a reason man i mean that's podovsky yeah. said i've got every record you ever made from like 1980 to, to yeah. 1987 and it was just the love of it and it really is the love of it the business of this is the business of this and it always will be but there are some companies and there are some people in the business of drums, shall we say, and uh, the, the orbital companies around them who are just fantastic, who are not the corporate types. They're the, the people that support us on tour. They're the people. I showed up at a rehearsal room, John Henry's in England. You ever been to John Henry's? I haven't. No, John Henry's a one of the great rehearsal places. And I showed up there and, and J.B. Henry, son of John Henry, comes and goes, who the hell are you? I mean, he goes, I know who you are, but who the hell are you? As I arrived, there was cases of gear waiting for me <laughs> <laughs> brand new heads to go on tour with you know mics every they're like my god you're well covered and i said yeah it's uh it's a truly lovely thing i'm well looked after 
I love it. I know. I mean, after all the years of like schlepping drums up wow. 60 floors and through the loading docks and all that. And of course, you know, I had a hernia, you know, from helping B3 players load their gear and everything. I had to get all filled with mesh and everything, but it's, it's like a battle scar, you know, of all the, so now for the last decade, having an amazing drum tech and he's like, how, what do you want your fans on tonight? Three, two, what are you Who's drinking tonight? Tech? Gatorade, you I'm, know, it's. I'm check your drum tech. Who's your drum tech? Oh, John Hall. He's a dear friend of mine. Best 10 years. Best in the business, man. Best, best, in, the, is the best. best in the business. And everybody has come <laughs> after him to steal him away from me. And he's like, I'm here, Rich, because he knows that, you know, you can go do a rock tour like Steely Dan or something, go do it for like four months, and then it's over. How do you know they're going to get back together? This gig just keeps going, which yeah, is... Touch wood. Touch wood. Yes. Because you know what? It is it is weird. It's a family. It is, it's a weird thing to say, but the bigger the band is, the less of a family it can become. Sure. It's fascinating being on tour with you, too. I opened the Just Retreat tour in... in, in mid 80s late 80s and um you you saw those guys have been together since the beginning the, the techs have been there since the beginning that's awesome and, you know i mean they, they are part of that family you know and there's a kindness that comes from that because there's a comfortability that comes from that so sure. they're kind, they're kind to their opening acts there's not that sort of meanness that comes from 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 new guys you know what i mean yeah uh, robin, I, I went and played with robin uh, with psychedelic furs which i thought was hysterical and because i had <laughs> I, I hadn't seen I hadn't seen them since the eighties, and they were like, "You used to play." I'm like, "Yeah," and they thought Robin was going to come and do an acoustic set. So I'm playing the Fillmore West, which I've never played, which I thought was so much fun to do. Just yeah. as one of so I've got a poster with Bill Graham presents, which is so cool. I always wanted one. Yeah, and uh, we just went out and not to be too rude to um, psychedelic like first fans, but we blew them off the stage playing songs <laughs> I've played for forty years. Yeah, it was so much fun. It was just, it's such a wonderful thing to do. But yeah, the people that support us are, are, are way more important than people think. He could probably, he could probably do your sound check without you, couldn't he? Um, oh, Johnny? Yeah, yeah, sure. Yeah, it's so, it's so funny. We, um, I always wish that we would be a band that wouldn't have a sound check because I know there's a lot of acts out there that don't, but we've always been a band that does a sound check somewhere between 3.30 and 4.20 every day. Um, and, uh, you know, it's just more time in the trenches. It's, it breaks up the day, but it's just you know, more time yeah. on your instrument, you know. And I'm, I'm crazy. Like, for the last, I don't know, 15 years, I will get up and do a master, class, a, a master class clinic, a lesson, or a motivational speech before my sound check every day. Yeah, good. So it's been it's been fun. Jim knows I I, I, I hustle, man, and I'm in an, I'm in another period of my life really? where I'm kind of in reinventing myself, and that's why I'm so curious about. I want to I want acting advice, man. I want to. What, you did your first job. What was your second job? What's the What did you learn from all? What did you learn from all these years doing all these different shows from the X Files to Silk Stockings to Monk to Law and Order? It's is it still exciting for you? Do you still love it? Never did Law and Order, but I've done okay. Well, I just assumed if you've done Monk, I all those booked a couple of Law and Orders. And never That's crazy them. that you never did Law and Order. But here's the thing: I'm that guy. I'm, I'm I've always been that guy. You think about you as a drummer, and think about me as as an actor for a bit. And you go like, okay, we've got nine pages of dialogue, and it's kind of really complex, and it's a lot of words, and it's a villain. Who shall we get? And when they can't find Jeremy Irons to do it, or, you know, they're not going to pay hundreds of thousands of dollars to somebody who's, you know, superb at it. Or they'll go like, oh, television, let's get Mark Shepard. And it's like, they give me, they give me the scenery to chew for the time. I'm, the, I'm there to be the interest. The same way as if I, need, if I need you to learn 15 songs and do them tomorrow, you'll not only do them, you'll bring something to them. If I need you to copy the previous drummer, if I need you to play what he played, because it goes with that click and it goes with that org, yeah. you'll do it. And that's kind of what I am. And then the struggle for me is to bring my own thing to it. And it's, I, I've been lucky enough to work with some amazing writers. My friends, I don't have a lot of actor friends. I have a lot of writer friends. And they're the people that have, have you know, that go, oh, you want to do this? And you read it and you go, oh my God, what are they trying to get me to do? And it's the same thing as when you're presented with a song. It's, there's no difference. It's like, where's your voice in this? Where's your thing in this? Where, what do you want to, do you get a feel out of this? What do you want to do? And it's the same thing as going, wouldn't this be interesting in halftime? It's the same thing as me going, hold on a second. 
why are we all shouty here? Let's let's bring it down a bit and see well, what this. Is how doing. do you first of all? How do you internalize overnight nine pages of dialogue? You don't. Um, mm. You don't. But it's the same way as you know. I watched Lionel Lewis reading charts. I've never seen anything like it in my life. This yeah. reading guys. I mean, you did that. You know, you know what I'm talking about. Yeah. But watching that boy play as hard as he hits for a jazz player. I'm watching him read charts that I would take 10 minutes to read six bars, kind of. What, where the hell is that? I have a question for you. What? <laughs> if you had an app that you could subscribe to and get exactly how Rich transcribes and charts his songs, would you subscribe? No. <laughs> <laughs> I like his drumming. Not Plus, he did it in his villain voice. <laughs> I know. <laughs> no, dude, I love you as a drummer. If I didn't love you as a drummer, I'd be doing this. But I'm saying, you, you're something special. No matter how you want to complicate it or bag it or explain it to somebody, that's like acting teaching. It's like me directing. It's, I have to get out of the way of it sometimes. But there's a pure, there's a pureness and an absolutely. There's a perfection in some things. And if you screw with people and you mess with their heads and you make them all play the same, you know, it doesn't work. You, you know that when you get a when you get a student, you go, that's odd. That's not me. That's, I don't, I can't do that because I'm not that. But how do I get that person to the next step? How do I get that person further than where they are? That's a real teacher. And a lot of it, as you've discovered, because you're 50 now and you're not 25 anymore. Yeah. There's a psychology in this. Because it is a business, because it is something where you're marketing yourself. It is something where people will pick you depending on whether they like you or can trust you or, or, you know, you have a good reputation, any of those things which are vital. And finding where to put your energy when you're a a nervous person or when you're a, a, a truly anxious person is the hardest thing to do. And so if we're instilling confidence in the people that we're teaching, we're not showing them how to do it. We're showing them how they should find out how to do it. Yeah. It's a big difference. It's a massive difference. You can't teach acting. You can only provide a place where magic can happen. You can't teach drumming. You can show people what things will help them, and yeah. you can help critique. I mean, there's some incredible – Elitch, for example. Yeah. The guy fixes his posture. I mean, that's one of the greatest things I've ever seen. I mean, I'm probably an inch shorter – than I really am just from compressing myself on a drum stool for oh for slouching drum. yeah slouching is and then you look at Elitch and I go and I, I watch the stuff he plays online the stuff people look at me go yeah just go watch him playing with Mars Volta like for ten minutes you go like oh my god yeah there's is a it, lot going on is it not only a lot going on but he's having fun doing it oh absolutely I mean, now the fir- now if Elitch got his hands on me and he's like at least a generation younger than me has different concepts is approaching it differently right. first thing he would try to do is he would try to get me to sit up straighter and he would try to get me to pull my beater out of the head because I bury yep. the beater and 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 I'm already at this point thinking to myself I'm going to save the money because I don't want to fix it no, I, and I understand that. And that's, that's fine. But the fun thing to do, and you're not having to go on tour for three months. Yeah. Go find out from me if you try something and you actually feel better. Sure. That's where half the people I know that have ever worked with him. Oh, yeah. Go, I don't want to do it. They're getting great oh, results. I actually, yeah. I found somewhere in the middle that made it better for me. Sure. You know, I mean, that's, it's just, you know, you're stuck in your ways. I'm stuck in my ways about a lot of things. Not always, not certainly not about teaching, but about, about, what we can be comfortable with if you've got to go play 40 dates. Yeah. I mean, you've got to, you know, I know when I want to eat, I know how long I got to sleep, but when somebody comes in and goes, eh, what if you did this? I mean, I had this, I have this weird thing with setting up drum kits. It's, I can get myself really uncomfortable. I can get myself really, really uncomfortable. You mean, not- you mean because you don't want to do it? You don't want to set it up and tear it down? No, or no? because, because I physically have moved something slightly out from where I'm at or my body is slightly out of what it is. So I'm understanding as I'm getting older, my body doesn't adapt the way it did when it was 25 years old. Yeah. I could, I could be off on one hip for two years. I wouldn't have noticed, but now if I do that, I won't sleep at night. So there are, there are interesting things, you know, it's not like I've got to put orthotics on and, and, and no. wear a back brace. But no, I, you know. I, I still feel like fun and flirty and, and I, fit and fun, you know? Dude, nobody's saying you're old. <laughs> but I mean, I just feel like the drumming, drummers always look 10 years younger than they are because there's this it's physical, we're passionate about it, we get out of bed with a smile on our face because we know we're going to get to play the drums. 
yes, I agree with that. But I think, I think we we mystified it a lot, and we don't need to. I think yeah. there's a lot of you know Remo Belli's entire uh, modus operandi was 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 put uh, drumsticks in kids' hands, put drums in kids' hands, because it changes you. It ch- be having an effect instantaneously in music without having to learn chords or song, but having a feel that is instantly there is a magical thing. And I watch, you know, I've got, I put a video up of my baby girl with a pair of my sticks just starting to play and she's playing in time. It's like creepy. I was like, well, this really, it's, it's a natural thing. And we are, I I think it's a magical thing. We we, we pass it down. Okay. So one last thing about the nine pages of dialogue, you get the, you, (laughs) this is my acting lesson for the day. So you, are you going to stay up all night stressed about making sure that it's all in your head or with this amount of experience and time in the trenches, you say to yourself, okay, nine pages of dialogue. We're going to probably break this up into three chunks. Well, I'm, no, I'm going to, I'm going to give you an answer that you're going to realize is exactly the same as your own answer for a, for a new piece of music. That's really challenging, right? You might break it up into chunks. You might do whatever, but here's the point. You know how you can remember a really good joke? Sure. But the telling of the joke is completely changed by who you're telling it to, where you're telling it, and what the response is. Ah. Right? So I don't actually learn things by rote. I don't learn what they mean necessarily. I don't learn what the feelings are necessarily. But I know the words. The brain picks up 85% of things unconsciously. I mean, my God, get out of bed, you know, go to the bathroom, turn the tap on, brush your teeth, right, turn around. That takes like 12 and a half million actions. If they were conscious, you'd lose your mind. So there's a lot the brain does unconsciously. So if you read it and you get a sense of it and you get the story and you were able to tell it to somebody else of what it's really about, you got it. So you've got the song. You might, yeah, I've got the bridge. I've got the thing. I know where that is. There's a bit of a rise there. I'll see what happens. You know what I mean? But my thing is when I approach the set or stage, it's completely different depending on who the hell I'm talking to or whether I'm talking to nobody at all or whether I'm talking to a hamster, if you know my work, um, whether I'm talking to, you know, it, it, and I don't, I, I just have to allow what I feel to come through. I can't dictate what I'm going to feel. You know, it's not charting. It's not the same as charting. Learning, learning lines is not charting. Charting is part of it. The, the, you know, what it is is going, do I, do I agree? Do I disagree? Do I, what do I feel? Where is yeah, it? You at? have to understand. There you go. What so is a depth, a depth of understanding as, depth, opposed okay. to, as opposed to the ability to parrot something back. Yeah, parroting sucks because you never will truly get it in your brain until you understand you it. You don't even know what your opinion is going to be until you say it. I mean, it's, it's, you might believe something and then the way somebody's responding changes it. It's the same as music. It doesn't exist until you played it. It doesn't exist until you walked out on that stage or you did it in the rehearsal room. But if, genuinely, when you walk out the first time to play that as an encore or a, an extra track and you go, let's see how the crowd feels about this. That's the moment you find out whether you did your homework or not. Damn. Does that make sense? Totally. Thank you. That's my big acting lesson. I got. I had two acting le- lessons today. <laughs> There's three drummers in this room, the Zoom room. Jim, is it that time? Random sure question is. of the day. You ready? It's the random question, random question, random question of the day. Who played on that? It was programmed <laughs> and composed by my buddy Jeremy Little. He's a little TV and film composer. So nobody played on that. That was awesome that was guy. Roger Lynn played on that. Yeah. <laughs> it was like finger okay. drums on a Mac. Okay. Sorry. What was the question? <laughs> <laughs> Is that I'm the question? A random question. That was the random question. That was it. We're getting to it. Okay. No, I said that was the random question. Who played drums on that? There we go. <laughs> I have a random question. Roland Lynn. With, with such an iconic voice and said, so, you know, what was that? Do, you, do people ask you to say things for them? No. Never? Uh, well, the head of BBC America said, do you do promos? I was doing Doctor Who. And I said, right. oh, really? And then I spent five years being the voice of BBC America. which was so You didn't even want to do it. And it's, it just came to you. Well, I'm not, I'm not belligerent. I don't tell people to go disappear. But sometimes I have to be enticed into it. You know what I'm saying? Yeah. Well, I mean, nice. it's, uh, you know, some of the more ridiculous lines that you've said in, in 
your your tenor and your cadence. No one in the history of torture has been tortured with torture like the torture you'll be tortured with. <laughs> <laughs> Which annoys me because it ends right. with a preposition. It ends with a preposition. It's annoying because you want to say torture at the end. No one in the history yeah. of torture has been tortured with torture like the torture you'll be tortured with. Torture? With? Tortured with? Like the torture, like the torture with which you're about to be tortured. Nah, see, it doesn't work. That's why you're not a writer. <laughs> yeah, Jim, stay in your lane, buddy. All right, I'll crawl back on my ashtray. I'll no. be over here. But no, they, they, people do ask. But I mean, listen, I, I do cameo and I do all sorts of things just because I like to keep content. I'm a talker, as you know, and storytellers, as you, you are, Rich. And you like an audience, and I love an audience. It's the chance to actually honestly engage with people and, and share frank exchange of ideas. Yeah. And so I do occasionally get, can you say this to my wife? And I'm like, dude, it's not only written badly, it doesn't make any sense. And I really don't want that on the internet. Yeah. You're and rewriting then, cameo clients' <laughs> they, they requests. No, they, no but because they're asking me to do something that's supposedly in character, their idea of an idea of an idea. And then I get these wonderful responses, all oh, due respect. And they go, can you just, do something funny. I'm like, sure, I'll think of something funny. But, you know, I've had so many, you think about the last year and what's been going on the last year. There's been so many people contacting me uh, with, with, with deaths in the family and with, with just horrendous stuff that's going on in their lives. There's mental health issues going on that, with people that have never had mental health issues. It's the most stressful time we've probably experienced True. for probably a hundred years. Yeah. And the truth is, you know, it's all about love, man. It's all about love. It's all about sharing. I love what you do with your, with your teaching. I think it's, I think it's a brilliant thing. Podcast is just sharing some love and happiness. And let's, let's not positivity. Telling, yeah. And let's not keep telling drummers they can't do it. Let's just make them go out there and give it a go. I mean, oh, of course. Like, wow. I only got one life. Break it. Break it. <laughs> you only got one life. You don't want to be a member of the woulda, coulda, shoulda club, you know? Absolutely. And you know what? And the encouragement we get from our peers or our heroes mm. is essential. It's essential. I've been helped. I've been loved. I've been treated beautifully by the drum community, yourself included, and Glenn, and all sorts of people that I, I look up to as, as just one. I, mean, I had the greatest conversation with Alice Cooper. You really want to – the greatest conversation ever. And I said, I, I, I know Glenn, your drummer. And he goes, yeah, he goes, you want to know why I hired Glenn? I'm like, sure. He goes, I play with all these kids and they're really good. And I'd ask them, who taught you to play? And they go, oh, Glenn. <laughs> and he goes, so I got Glenn Sobel. <laughs> I told Glenn that. He was like, yeah, I heard it. Go, but, yeah. it but it's there's a there's a, a thing to it. There's the, the, We have our heroes. You're talking about Greg Bissonette. I remember when Greg was at the height of what he was doing when I was playing. And I'd look at him and go, I can't do any of that stuff. His big band stuff is extraordinary. His yeah, feel is extraordinary. But I know I can sit in a 4-4 pocket as good as anybody on this planet. I know I can. <laughs> Me too. A little bit yeah, of it. Yeah, Jim. And you either have it or you don't. And if you have it, I encourage you to do it. And I know you guys do as well. And I think that's fantastic. Well, thanks, Mark. Hey, did we ask a question or no? We wanted to remove... We can ask a question. I'm Jim, are you open to a random question? I can, I can stay here for days. You can tell. I can well, Jim, I, Jim's probably got his dinner's getting cold on the dinner okay. table. But like, I, like I need dinner, right? <laughs> um, well, I can't see you from the neck down. <laughs> <laughs> I'm, I'm, a, I'm, a, I'm big boned. Let's just put it that way. What song would you pay money to never hear again? Uh, I don't feel that way about music. I mean, there is so no. much. There, no, I'm not being. I'm not being an ass about this. I'm being dead no. serious. I mean, even playing Margaritaville or, or uh, you know, Brown Eyed oh, Girl there's, is fun. There's, there's, there's places for everything. Yeah. yeah. You know, something on Endless Loop like Teddy Bear's Picnic would drive you crazy, and you can use that as, as Baby Shark. But Baby Shark, yeah. But I mean, mm. the Narwhal song is just as good. And I've got kids, so. Um, <laughs> but truthfully, I think there's. Yeah, while I'm very opinionated about what music I do and I don't like, I've got a I've got a kid that went from DJing to playing jazz piano, and Ted Howe is his teacher, which is mind blowing to me. Yeah, he's been playing for about a year, and he's doing stuff on a '74 Fender Rhodes, sitting downstairs, and I'm like, I'm watching him lap up, and he's screaming at this piano going, why can't my fingers do what my brain wants them to do? And he's 21 <laughs> years old and he's listening and he's playing me music I don't know. Incredible music I don't know. 
And that's the thing is we have to be open to everything. It's good to be polarized. You know, oh, I hate country music. I don't, oh, it's no such thing. You go, you find, you can go through so many eras of country music and find stuff that is heartbreaking, that is rabble rousing, that is everything that every other type of music is too. Yeah. You know, I mean, and just the thing about, as I said, the thing about country, what makes it so peculiarly American is it speaks to so many people because the stories are simple and real. Yeah. And we can tell. And when it's phony, and when it's phoned in and it's over clever, you know, it's, it's trying to make a political point or it's trying to make, it doesn't work. What yeah. works is when somebody's just telling you the damn story they want to tell you. And we're like, uh-huh, whether it's Dolly or Merle or any, it doesn't make any difference. Yeah. It doesn't, it, the, the carrier doesn't matter. Sturgill Simpson, as I said, is, is somebody you can, you, he's just extremely. Really, really sink your teeth into, Yeah. And that's that's the future again of country. I mean, we, we went through a pop phase where everybody was playing country. It wasn't that country to me. Yeah. It had that weird middle ground. Sure. But it's, it's the voices and 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 uh, it's the voices that change it for me, especially in country music. It's it's that sound, you know. You know, listen to. There's just some incredible, incredible people out there. That, uh, we'll always have, yeah, the talent. I tell you, this has been amazing. Mark, this can go on forever. I got to tell you, my co-host has got kids, and I think they're in athletics, and he's got to go pick them up or drop them off or cheer them on. My but, kids just finished college. Now, I've got a four-year-old, a 15-year-old, and a 21-year-old. I love it. Wow. I've been, I've been married way more times than you have, so that's uh, <laughs> you still, no, you that's two years. times for you? Four what? times? Well, the internet only knows about two of them. No, nah, well, the internet doesn't. Know. <laughs> well, listen, we, I, I'm, I'm lucky to have your number. I can text you weird memes and we gifts will. over the holidays. When, when I get to come to town, I want to come and hang out. We will go to it. As you know, I don't drink, so I can be the designated driver. Oh, definitely. And uh, if not, I want to come to a show so bad. I'd love to come and see you guys play. I just we'll make uh, it happen, of course. Yeah. And and I'm a part time Angelino. Like I'll be in L. A. Most of 2021. I live in West Hollywood, so. Give me, give me a shout. We'll, we'll, go, yeah. we'll go. Perfect. We'll go. Jim, I appreciate you, man. Three drummers Jim. walk into a room. We close yeah. the place don't, down. Jim, and- don't talk so much next time. <laughs> <laughs> he, you know, Jim's my muse. Jim McCarthy's voiceovers.com. Buddy, we appreciate your time and talent. Mark, thanks for joining us, man. We really appreciate it. To our listeners out there, I got an email address for you. The Rich Redmond Show at gmail.com. As always, subscribe, share, rate, and review. Keep coming back for the good stuff. We appreciate it. Mark, we'll talk to you soon. Bye, everybody. This has been The Rich Redmond Show. Subscribe, rate, and follow along at richredmond.com.